Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, it's been a while since I did a tutorial. I've had a lot of stuff that's under non-disclosure agreements, so uh, I can't really show them until they've been published. But uh, this, fortunately, it was a private commission without a non-disclosure agreement or an NDA, so I can show you what I was working on. Uh, so this is a Templar painting. Right now I'm just doing a sketch. Uh, my client was really nice and provided me with a ton of reference material. You know, he had uh, specifics for every piece of armor, um, the weapon, the background, etc., etc. So pretty much off screen, I have a reference sheet which I'm using. And uh, right now I'm just doing a quick, uh, mostly value study, but I'm just trying to figure out the composition and show some of the design elements of the character. Uh, this process at the beginning took only about 23 minutes or so. Um, and once again, it's, it's not a finished painting, it's just to sort of show where this is headed. Uh, I generally do this because if I jump too far into a painting and then I show it to the client and they don't like it, uh, I just waste a lot of time. So it's better to just do a rough sketch like this. Um, also you'll notice I'm working in color from the start. Uh, I've adapted my style to work in color from the beginning rather than grayscale. Uh, I still value grayscale for its values and the fact that it lets me focus on contrast rather than having to worry about hues. But I found if I work in color, uh, at least at my current skill level, that I can knock out a piece in about a third the time that it used to take me if I were to work in black and white exclusively. So that's why I'm working in color now. Uh, unfortunately for the rate I'm being paid and the number of pieces I have, I can't dedicate that much time to each painting. Uh, otherwise, I just wouldn't be able to keep up with my deadlines and I wouldn't be able to put uh, food on the table and pay the bills. So anyway, that's why I made that change. Uh, if I have more free time, then I probably will start doing grayscale again. But I kind of like working color, so I'm, I think I'm just going to keep with it for now. It's also a lot more natural. It's, uh, you know, it's a little bit more like working with traditional media. I'm primarily working on you know one or two layers, uh, which are really more just safety nets than anything else. So as you can see, I'm doing some mountains in the background. Uh, the story behind this character is uh, he's supposed to be a Templar, uh, kind of from an, a role-playing game. I think it was D&D or something similar. Um, probably not D&D since there's a lot of crosses, and I'm, and I'm pretty sure D&D doesn't have uh, crucifixes and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, this was uh, my my client's personal character from his role-playing game group and he wanted some original art done for it so he got in contact with me and we uh, worked something out. Anyway, uh, so this was a interesting painting to do. This character had a lot of elements uh, from you know medieval history and uh, some video game stuff. He's got a scythe and a little crown a uh, circle it like Dante from Dante's Inferno uh, so we did use Dante from the game from the video game um, as a reference but it's not really the same character as you can tell by the armor layout even the weapon even though it's a scythe it's not the exact same scythe same with his uh, crown and everything else there's a lot of uh, original elements here it was just used as uh, inspiration and uh, to reference sort of the weapon and uh, crown piece So here I'm just working on the face. Uh, I do have reference for a face, which is off screen. I think I was using, uh, originally I had a combination of Dante from Dante's Inferno for the face and uh, Arthas from World of Warcraft, but the, uh, the lighting scheme wasn't quite agreeing between the two references, which causes problems. And the reference I had of Arthas was a very top-down shot which makes his face distorted so I didn't like where it was going also Arth Arthas has sort of this kind of uh, I don't know how to describe it but he's got kind of like a these proud features he's like puckered lips and very kind of dainty nose and stuff um, and this guy I wanted him to be kind of more brutal you know he's like a medieval guy not some fanciful whatever so uh, I know that, you know, I know Arthas is like a brute, like, you know, super badass from World of Warcraft and everything. But uh, I wanted this guy to be kind of a little bit more down to earth, um, kind of a bit more uh, rugged, if you will. So anyway, uh, I ended up actually redoing the face 
um, using reference from Braveheart, believe it or not. I use Longshanks um, when he's in full plate mail. Or I'm sorry, in full chain mail as the reference. So, uh, yeah, fortunately, the reference with Longshanks had him wearing his little circlet, so it was perfect. Um, also, what I realized was that the reference for Dante was pretty inaccurate, um, just the way his chainmail was falling around his head and neck. It's not really how chainmail uh, chain is usually tailored. So I like the reference that I found from the film because it, just, it was way more authentic and realistic feeling. And I like that better. So I'm still working on the face here. <clears throat> now, uh, the client specifically asked for there to be a, cra uh, a cross element, cross design element, uh, placed in the center of the circlet. So it's very important that we have that there. And if you notice, I'm not really doing a lot of detail on the metalwork because this is a very small portion of the painting, but um, I'm really just using some harsh tones, some high contrast values to uh, establish, establish form. Okay, so I think this is the point where I start switching reference. And you'll notice it doesn't look like long shanks. Um, when I use reference, I don't want a 100% duplicate because that's just a derivative. I want something that I'm using for reference. I'm looking at it for you know, hints in the anatomy, hints in the lighting, hints in the shadows. It's not supposed to be a copy and paste. It's not a photo manipulation, it's a painting. So remember that when you're using reference materials. Um, also, I found it useful to just temporarily paint over the nose guard. Um, it's actually quite difficult to paint a face accurately when part of it is obscured. I find it much easier to paint the whole face and then obscure it afterwards. I know it seems like you're wa I'm wasting my time because some of the details aren't going to be shown anyway, but it's just, I don't know, it's easier for me that way. Also, you can see I'm making some alterations to this circlet to differentiate it from uh, Dante's headgear. And here we go, we're just adding some stubble, a little bit of a highlight to show that it's got that waxy sheen of facial hair. And uh, we're just reworking the chainmail to be more authentic appearing. Now what's kind of funny about this face, um, it sort of made me confront the fact that, so one of my favorite artists, just to sort of explain where I'm going with this, one of my favorite artists is Adrian Smith. Um, He's a uh, British illustrator who does a lot of work for Games Workshop, um, and I've been sort of, I've sort of grown up on his artwork um, throughout my uh, life, even before I was a professional. So uh, I noticed how much my work is starting to look like his, and it's funny because I'm not using him for reference. Like I don't have any Adrian Smith paintings or illustrations off to the side that you can't see. Um, I'll, I'll share my reference sheet so you can show it at the end. Uh, so you can see it at the end, but uh, it's just funny because his some of his stylistic techniques are getting carried through in my own work, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, also, you know, it says Deus Wilt um, on his nose guard that was specified in the purchase order or the contract with my client. So uh, those things do matter. Paying attention does matter even if it's only a couple pixels large. All right, so now we're doing the uh, the pauldron here. And he's got this neck protector. I don't know the name of it off the top of my head. I'm sure there's a French name for it. But uh, we'll just call it the neck guard for now. 
And uh, the pauldron is kind of a, it's this neat design where it's not only a shoulder piece, but it's a partial breastplate. Uh, it covers the, the joint to the armpit from the front. So in order to show that, I have to round out the, uh, the, the highlights to reflect the form. I'm trying to get the volume to be conveyed here. And we've got this nice skull motif. The reference I used uh, was first off not at this angle, it was a different angle. It was like a museum shot, but also it had uh, these dragons on it, and the client wanted skulls to be the unifying theme here. And uh, as you know, I, or hopefully know at this point, I do a lot of fancy fight games artwork, um, which is licenses Games Workshop intellectual property. Uh, so I do a lot of skulls at this point. I've gotten pretty good at painting skulls quickly, especially armor designs little design elements. Uh, one of the challenging parts of this armor was he wanted a lot. He wanted a chainmail cowl and undershirt, a breastplate over a leather jerkin with plate mail shoulder guards on top, and then all that to be covered by uh, this Templar robe. So there was a lot of stuff to include, and unfortunately you can't see all of it, but I did my best. So you can't really see the plate mail chest. I'm sorry, not the plate. Yeah, the plate mail uh, chest plate, or breastplate. It's just not visible because it's covered. But I tried to hint at everything else as much as possible. So you'll see that in the uh, in a lot of the shadows, there's chain mail peeking out, and around the sleeves and the thighs eventually we'll have the uh, the leather tunic. Which is a nice medieval studded leather tunic. Uh, my client also provided specific gauntlets he wanted referenced, uh, except that he wanted knuckles with skull motifs worked into them, which I am totally okay with, as uh, I happen to love doing them at this point. And just in general, I mean, skull knuckles are pretty sweet. I have actually worked them into a few designs in the past. But uh, anyway, we're doing the the metal here, and as you can see, the key to, to doing convincing metal is uh, sort of maxing out the reflectivity. You want it to look like it's a mirror, essentially, like a kind of dark mirror where uh, it, it's not 100% reflective, but it generally reflects its surroundings and distorts them. So for the underside of the gauntlet, if it was like leather, it'd be much darker. But since it's, you know, this polished uh, steel or whatever, it's got this nice bounce light originating uh, from the ground. So all types of fun stuff going on. I, I kind of like doing metal a lot. It takes a lot of... Uh, I guess thinking it, it's I, I I honestly have begun to actually not even begun because I, I talked about this in some of my other videos but when I render paintings uh, I tend to think of myself almost as a computer so you're just gonna have to forgive me if I start using computer lingo uh, but when I render my paintings and I do metal it kind of takes a lot of processing power. I have to do a lot of computations to figure out where the light's coming from in the scene. Um, I know that sounds weird because artists are usually more kind of touchy-feely. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I kind of – I don't have that same sort of background. Um, it's just not how I work. But, uh, yeah, so that's how I render out things. Also, one of the reasons I really like working in color from the start is – if you've seen some of my other videos, I always talk about – how my favorite part of the painting is the end when we we're done with color because I think I think doing color into a black and white composition is extremely tedious. I can't stand doing it, um, and it's just like you sit there and you've got your finished nice gray you know black and white monochrome, and you have to go over everything. You have to stop, color things, you you know you do all your masks etc., and then by the time you're done. Uh, the colors have kind of changed your composition. They've they've uh, they've altered your values. So you have to go back in and you have to reshade and re-highlight. I just hate that. My favorite part is just doing these little 
kind of renderings of armor and faces and details. And when I do color work from the beginning, um, I can just kind of jump to that stage. So I like doing that. Also, you notice I haven't added the skull knuckles yet because I forgot about that for a bit. And since I'm a pretty diligent artist, I kept checking my uh, my art order or the uh, description that my clients sent. And uh, eventually said, oh, right, 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 skull knuckles. I have to go back and have them. But they'll come. Don't worry. Uh, so right now I'm just working in the leather tunic. And uh, in order to do that, I have to sort of work on the figure a bit. And one of the mistakes I made was I started making the, the leather a little bit too wrinkly. And from the reference I had of the leather uh, tunic, the leather was actually kind of stiff. So I ended up going back and editing it. Also, uh, what's really important during this stage is to make sure that my shadows and highlights are consistent with the form I want to show. Um, this is difficult because once you start getting into the nitty gritty of the highlights and details, you sometimes forget where exactly your things are in space. So you can see I have my character's left arm is raised and his shoulder is a little bit back. And then his right shoulder, which is holding the bottom of the uh, scythe's haft, is tilted forward. And this is uh, in contrast to his left knee, which is raising up and moving and tilting his hip forward. Now, normally, I would have the head facing a different direction, forming a nice S curve. But this guy seems, you know, a little bit more, uh, what's the word, like, um, uh, like a single-minded, single folk, like narrow-minded, um, and sort of like kind of this crazed killer a little bit. Like, you know, I mean, he's clearly hardcore. This guy is not fooling around. Um, so I kind of like the idea that he just sort of marches at you and you're like, hey, can't we talk about this? And then he cuts your head off with a scythe. Uh, kind of a, a neat character. But uh, anyway, so that's why his head's faced that way. And of course, at this point, it would take a lot of effort to have it turned. There's always that factor. There's the story element, composition elements, and the laziness factor. Uh, with this much work done into the head, I would have to remaster it entirely. Pretty much just repaint it to have it face the other way. Also, part of his face would be occluded by his neck guard, and that would just kind of stink. So We did not end up doing that. Uh, also, in addition to wearing a chainmail cowl and a circlet, my commissioner wanted me to have him with a hood, which is kind of busy. So I thought it might be nice just to have the uh, the hood down over his shoulder. I think that was the right call. Okay, so here we go. We're working on the tunic some more. Um, and you can see I'm doing most of my painting with just eyedropper tool and the paintbrush. And I'm just using 100% round, 100% hard number one paintbrush. I'm not using any custom brushes yet. This is all just using the number one brush. People really underestimate its ability. Um, I get a ton of comments, a ton of comments. Actually, like I, I want to say like probably like 50% of my questions when I do the live streams are, hey, what brush are you using right now? Or even on the YouTube channel, people will quote me a time and say, what brush are you using right now? I can guarantee you about 95 to 98 percent of the time it's the hard round brush uh right now i'm just doing a quick skeletal overlay the reason i did that was uh, for a couple of reasons one i was doing this during a live stream and people were saying well this looks kind of off and i take people's critiques very seriously so i wanted to check for myself and make sure everything was right uh and it, it turned out it was it was fine but it's also just good to do that in general even if you don't feel critiquing you um because that's something that's really important to carry through when you're doing a painting, that uh, your anatomy and your pose stays consistent and accurate, or plausible even. That's a big one, too. It's really weird when characters just don't make sense. Okay, so working on the tabard here. Uh, this isn't really a traditional Templar outfit. Normally, uh, they would wear 
kind of these robes that went down to their knees, kind of like these long tunics. And uh, they would have a split in the front, so when you ran or moved around, your knees would poke through the, the split rather than having a, a loincloth or a tabard that would block your legs and get you all tangled up. But uh, this is obviously not a historical character, since no one in history carried sides like that into combat ever. But, uh, you know, just like an interesting design element that my client wanted to have. So it's there. All right, so we're just working on some of the folds here. Uh, as I mentioned in other posts and other videos, uh, cloth can be kind of difficult to do convincingly. So I did have some reference, not a lot. I actually just had uh, the, the cover art to the movie, uh, I think it's Ironclad. Um, which is about a Knight Templar in the Middle Ages. It's sort of like a Seven Samurai type movie, except set in medieval Europe. So I use that for a little bit of reference on the uh, outfit. Okay, so here we go, painting some skulls onto the belt, as the client requested. As you can see, I have gotten very fast at doing skull emblems and designs, because when you're doing Warhammer art, you have to be able to knock those suckers out like it's nobody's business. And there we go, some more skull elements and bone elements. Uh, the client specifically asked for uh, these thigh guards to have a spine and ribs. And for the knee pads to have, uh, or the, the knee guards to have a skull emblem. So there it is. And I'm doing a little bit of repositioning of the leg here. Uh, the skeleton was showed that us everything or showed us that everything was fine in terms of anatomy, but I just wanted to change the pose a little bit to make it more I don't know, it just didn't seem right. Sometimes you just have to go with your gut when you're doing paintings. And uh there I'm painting in the back of the robe as it's kind of flapping in the wind behind him. Okay, so just doing a little bit of cleanup now. Uh occasionally I gotta do cleanup because with my uh, when I when I do rendering like this, or just paint, you know, in one layer, uh, I tend to leave a lot of artifacts, a little leftover bits from my cleanup and you know touch-ups and fixes. So every once in a while, I have to go back and just make sure everything's clean and neat. Okay, so we're just doing some detailing here, and you notice I kind of flip between things. I'll do a little bit of this, and then I'll go to another part of the armor and do a little bit of that. Uh, right now I'm just doing the knee pad with the skull, getting the lighting to be as accurate as possible. I, remember, I don't have reference for this skull. Um, I do have a large human-sized skull in my studio, which I use for reference, but these are more sort of iconic, uh, you know, graphic design skulls versus anatomical skulls. Uh, so I didn't necessarily have reference for that. Um, same with these... You know, uh, the leg plates, uh, the thigh guard was actually referenced from Arthas again, um, Lich King. And uh, the greaves, I don't remember where my client got them. They were just sort of this random generic pair of greaves that he wanted used. So I did my best to make them look similar to it. They looked sort of like Soul Calibur greaves, you know what I mean? Like, they didn't look like that medieval, but... Um, because most of the time in medieval Europe, there were kind of knights would either have a full plate grieve, and just the front would be covered. It would kind of in the back you might have like a little clasp to hold it shut, and then you'd have like a couple interlocking plates over the front of the foot, and the back of the foot was just a boot. It wasn't really armored because you know it's pretty rare for someone to take a swipe at your heel. You know they're probably gonna be worried about your sword coming at them and whatnot. Um, but uh. That or you'd have just like a shin plate and then you'd have your, your leather boots hanging out of the bottom or like male socks or something. But uh, here we have a full plate suit. And uh, here you can see I'm doing some vertebra or vertebrae, I should say. Or depending on your pronunciation, vertebrae. <laughs> um, when I took Latin, it was always A-E was pronounced as I. But uh, I've heard it pronounced different ways. Since I know you all care about Latin pronunciation so much. 
Uh, so anyway, uh, we've got this nice kind of metallic sheen, and this was accomplished the same way as the other metal. You know, uh, we've got a nice highlight from the primary light source. Then we have the terminator, which is the darkest part of the shadow, uh, or the area anyway where the light tr starts contrasting to dark, transitioning. And then we have a nice bounce light on the side. And here I'm just doing some really quick embellishments. Uh, I've had developed ways to be doing embellishments very quickly, once again, for my work with Fancy Flight Games. Uh, a lot of Space Marines and stuff have filigree and whatnot, so it's good to have techniques to do them quickly. Uh, I usually will just use like a normal layer with a drop shadow, but I just didn't even use that in this case. There's, there's such a small area, I just sort of painted it in by hand. Did not take that long. Okay, so after zooming out, I realized that the top half was too big, so I simply lassoed the bottom half and blew it up a little bit. Control J and reposition. And here I'm adding rivets to unify the armor designs because the top of the armor has rivets, and so should the bottom. And even the belt gets some little rivets. Uh, I like having unified designs in my characters, otherwise I feel like all the parts are disparate and ununified. So, cannot stress having unity in your character designs whenever possible. It can be interesting to have people who are sort of hodgepodge characters, like post-apocalyptic or scavenger type characters, but even then you should sort of try to work things together in such a way that there's unity in the design. Otherwise you're just going to get a kind of unattractive character. Uh, at this point, I was I was not happy with the rear leg, so I started to go fresh and just paint it out and set up a new one. And uh, that's pretty much exactly what I did. I just had him kind of marching over this hill, standing there like a badass. I decided to try a new uh, design with the tabard, but it didn't really work out, so that didn't stick. Also, I realized that his tabard in the front was way too long. He wouldn't be able to walk around. He'd be tripping all over himself. So I ended up having to lasso and move that around, which will probably happen in a minute. Okay, so we're still doing some armor stuff. Just doing some interlocking uh, plates on the greaves and the thigh guards. And you can see I'm just sampling from other areas of my design. I'm not really you know, just using my color picker very much. Okay, so at this point I wanted to change my composition up a bit. I wanted to narrow it out. And here we're working on the greaves some more. And uh, changing this little rock, a outcrop a little bit. And here we go, doing some more work on these. I wanted to be careful how I did these. I didn't want them to be too contrasty. Um, I needed them to be a little bit more bland in the foreground foot uh, just because of aerial perspective. Okay, so time to start working on the little rocky area that this character is standing on, this Templar. Uh, so what I did was I just knocked in some shadows, and then I started doing my highlights just to sort of give it form. Uh, and I realized the foot was kind of too daintily pointed down. It looked like he was sort of stepping onto this awkward round thing rather than a flat area. So I just quickly lassoed it, changed it. Really quick, really dirty. So that's my phone. My phone makes this angelic choir sound when I get an email. And uh, the client specifically asked for there to be a Bible on this guy's hip, so I had to paint that guy in. And here we go. Doing a little work on the Bible. The Bible is super simple to do. All it is is a rectangular prism. So as long as you can draw straight lines and understand how a rectangular prism or a box, for a layman's terms, uh, is shaded, very quick to do. And then it's just really a matter of doing design elements in perspective. Um, I'm very familiar with the way medieval and kind of tome books look just from having to use them a lot in the material. Uh, you know, a lot of four, uh, Warhammer characters carry them, a lot of 
fantasy characters carry them, whether it's spell books or Bibles or Lectivio Divinatus or whatever, uh, they're pretty common. So I make sure to be good at them at this point. And, you know, just doing some kind of like leather press designs, you know, a little bit of binding, throwing in a little bit more shadow and buffing out the edges to make it look a little bit more raised. And, uh, you know, why not? We're going to do some rivets in the surface of this, studs, or metal tacks, and a nice big cross on the front because we need more crosses. It's clear that this guy is questioning in faith or has some doubts about his stance on religion. Um, and it's just, you know, a nice quick dirty cross with some gold inlay or whatever. And that's that for the Bible. Uh, also, I just realized that his legs were too short. He was only like six and a half to seven heads tall, which is actually accurate. Most people are about seven, seven and a half heads tall. But I wanted him to be heroic, so I bumped him up to about eight and a half, eight heads tall. And uh, just quickly doing some chain here. I did not use my chain brush. I do have custom brushes for doing chain. However, I find that they tend to look sort of programmatic they don't look very authentic so if I have the opportunity and I'm not doing a lot of chain I'll sometimes just paint them by hand and here are we go finally fixing that tabard as promised earlier to make it just a little bit more reasonable in length okay so we're working on the haft of the scythe now and the client specifically requested it look like a spine um, so we've got a lot of skulls, a lot of crosses, and a lot of bone uh, design elements here, which is I'm cool with. Um, people ask me how he would be able to grip this thing with the vertebra. Uh, that's a good question. You know, I tried to show that the vertebra around where he's gripping it sort of take uh, a couple notches down in scale. You can see that the areas where he wouldn't be gripping it, like the center, are a little bit more large. They're protruding a little bit bit more than the areas where he's holding it. So the bottom and the top have smaller notches, whereas the middle area has larger notches. But ultimately, it would be pretty hard to wield um, because, you know, it's got spikes, but whatever. I mean, he's like a medieval Templar. These dudes were into autoflagellation, which if you're not familiar with the term, it's when uh, monks would sort of expiate their sins or cleanse themselves of sin by whipping themselves repeatedly. So... These guys were into wearing, you know, hair shirts, which just make you constantly itchy and miserable all the time. Uh, all types of nasty, self-induced, masochistic tortures to uh, redeem themselves in the eyes of God and make themselves feel better. So, these guys were uh, pretty nasty. This is how people actually used to get their jollies back in the day, believe it or not, uh, with torturing themselves or others. It's good times. The Inquisition was notorious for this. Uh, you know, through pain comes redemption, all that jazz. But anyway, uh, enough about my personal beliefs. Let's uh, let's get back to the painting. So the client wanted a darkened metal scythe uh, with a nice big engraving, say, in hoc signo winces, which is actually a historical phrase. Um, comes from the Emperor Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor. Uh, essentially, during a battle, um, he looked up to the sky and there was the Cairo symbol. Uh, this all occurred at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, uh, which was a famous historical event. But uh, essentially the idea was that he saw the symbol in the sky, which is Cairo, which is the symbol of the papacy. It's uh, it's the X with the P intersecting it. Um, and he heard the voice of God, or he, he, he saw you know, divinely inspired uh, in hoc signo winkus, you know, in this sign you will conquer. It's a Latin phrase. And uh, Constantine, according to legend or history or myth, uh, had all his guys painted onto his sh their shields, and sure enough, they won the battle. And after that, he converted to, uh, to Christianity. There was no Catholicism at the point. It was just all Christianity. Um, because there were no divisions at this point. This is very early Christianity. Um, so uh, that's how that happened. And it's kind of cool. I, I kind of like that the client had these 
historical references, you know, Deus Wultz is God wills it. It's on the guy's forehead, and now on his scythe he's got an hoc signa winkus, which is kind of a grim thing to have on your scythe. Um, pretty much, you know, pretty grim. <laughs> You're going to die. Uh, uh, so in order to do the text, I just uh, quickly use the pen tool there, and I use the type tool on the pen tool, so typing along a path is what it's known as. Uh, I got this font. I've had this font for a while. It's called Charlemagne. And it's this nice kind of medieval gothic font. Uh, and all I did was I just sort of typed out the phrase and uh, letter by letter I went and I scaled them to fit so that they would perfectly fit the outline of the etching. Uh, so it took a little bit of time and it was a little bit tedious, but it really wasn't that hard to do. And then uh, once that was done, I just went in and I did a little bit of a drop shadow. And then I uh, did some more etching, some gold inlay, because I love doing gold inlay, if you haven't noticed. Uh, I do a lot of gothic type of stuff, Christian medieval gothic stuff. Um, and they, they love that 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 stuff. So, And of course, when in doubt, add more skeletons. So he's got this nice skeleton with its arms at its side and some little angel wings which you'll see in a second coming off of its scapula, uh, scapulae or scapulae and up here we got a little bit more etching and you know all types of fun stuff and then I wanted something cool at the top so I thought it'd be kinda cool if we had a skull and it looks almost like it's shouting the words and what's also neat about it is that the vertebra of the skull. So you kind of almost have like ribs at the top and then the spine of the skull uh, goes down the entire length of the shaft and then terminates in the coccyx, which is your tailbone. So, which is the counterweight on the scythe in this case. So it was kind of neat. It was a little bit of like an anatomical nod. Um, just sort of a, a kind of nice design element. At least I think it, it turned out nicely. And here you can see I'm actually connecting the vertebra uh, or the vertebrae into the base of the skull. And uh, of course, doing just a little bit more etching to jazz it up. And more skulls because I can. Okay, also, uh, the client requested that this guy have a large iron cross hanging from his. Uh, his waist belt. So here we go. He didn't want any crucifixes. He didn't want any uh, Jesus iconography. He just wanted the crosses. So I'm okay with that. And uh, you know, it's this nice giant iron inlaid cross with like an onyx setting or something. Kind of cool. And it's connected with a little chain. And once again, painted by hand, not using a tool or a special brush. And it's really not that difficult. All you have to do is sort of think about where the chain links are in real space and then just kind of paint them in. It's it's not that difficult. Oh, here we go. We're finally doing the knuckle skulls. And once again, it's not difficult. I'm just doing little spheres, little half spheres um, with uh, little skull faces. And uh, it, it's pretty quick to do, at least the way I do them. All right, so... Now that the character is primarily done, it's time to address the midground and the background. Um, so what I decided to do was I thought it might be neat to kind of have him uh, have these framing elements of smoke drifting up or dust or clouds or whatever. So he's got these kind of cool, uh, it almost looks like a sulfurous fume. If we're going to get all biblical about it. Some brimstone. And I'm not using any special brushes. I'm just using the brush. That's all. Just You can see at the top, just the round brush with a varying opacities. Uh, I use pen pressure for diameter. I don't use it for opacity. Um, also, I imported this texture from my texture library. It's just uh, like a granite facing. And using a mask and a soft light layer, I just incorporated it in to get some nice quick textures uh, onto that stone. I'm not going to leave it like that because that's lazy. 
Um, I'm just using that to add some texture that would take me time and effort rather than just doing little notches or whatever with a brush. And uh, originally the client requested a severed head or a torso on the base, but I thought it, was, it wouldn't really fit compositionally. So I wanted to hint to that by adding blood to the scythe. Nothing too dramatic. I didn't want like you know like gore hanging off the scythe or anything, but just something to show that it's it's been used. And uh, here we're adding some more midground elements. We can see that the foreground stone is sort of dropping off into the midground. And uh, because of that, it has less detail, more aerial perspective. And we have that uh, con uh, continuation of the uh, fog or the smoke or whatever this is. It looks almost volcanic, doesn't it? Now, I thought a cool idea would be to incorporate some skulls into the actual rock themselves. So using my human replica skull, which I have sitting here, I just sort of added some shadows and highlights that uh, are in the face portion of the skull. Um, you know, just the nasal cavity and the eye sockets, and the, the cheekbones. Just, you know, just a hint that there's a skull design. I didn't really want it to be an actual skull. Just something a little bit more subtle. But you can see it's, it's there and it adds this sort of grim aspect that we clearly don't already have with all the skulls and religious iconography and everything, but when in doubt, more skulls. All right, and uh, to sort of carry through the aesthetic of the clouds, I sort of uh, add these little spires of rock jutting off. some more foreground rock. Okay. Adding some more smoke drifting up. And here that was just me quickly checking the size of the head, making sure he was the right perspective uh the right scale. And there he is. He was actually still a little bit too small for my liking. I wanted him to be really imposing. I mean I think the reference said he was like over six foot something, so when people are that large, their heads in proportion to their bodies tend to be a bit smaller. It's just one visual cue you can use to add uh, size to a character, indicating his size. Smaller head is usually a larger character. Um, infants tend to be like you know four heads tall or five heads tall, and children as they grow become you know five heads tall, six heads tall, and eventually seven heads, seven and a half, which is an adult. And superhumans or superhero characters are usually, actually, believe it or not, 10 heads tall. I believe I think Marvel characters are like 9 or 10 heads tall. Makes them even more imposing and uh, mythic. Okay, so we're doing some work on Jerusalem. That's the background or the setting here. It's supposed to be the Holy Land. So I just quickly got some reference. And I, I noticed that Jerusalem had a lot of these domes um, for its churches and synagogues and whatnot. Uh, so I thought it would be a nice element to add in. So here we go. Now, notice, because we're so far away from the city and because there's so much dirt and debris and detritus in the air, uh, we have a lot of aerial perspective, and this is a good thing because the more aerial perspective there is, the less detail work you have to do. Um, when you have a lot of aerial perspective, you can get away with just doing highlights and shadows. It's a trick a lot of environment artists use uh, just to flood your scene with mist, smoke, dust, whatever, because it saves you a lot of time. And it's a legitimate thing, and also, you know, it looks makes stuff look cool, so uh, it's it's not a bad thing. It's it's not necessarily lazy either. It can be a design choice, but uh, I like to use it when I can. So here you can see I'm just sort of hinting at buildings, this urban sprawl uh, as it drifts away into the distance onto these slopes. You can see these little, uh, these little buildings and their facings and shadow and highlight. And running some closer buildings, which are a little bit more contrasted, and some more birds to help tie the uh, composition together. Yeah. 
and I thought it was a little bit empty out there, so I just added some more details to the clouds to show depth. Got this nice sort of golden glow coming from uh, off canvas, right? But it can be fun to do clouds like that, so it doesn't take a lot of effort. Once again, you just take a round brush and then fade out half of the stroke. It's pretty easy. And right now I'm just sort of surveying. Anytime you see a long pause, it's it's me sitting there and just looking at the picture and trying to find things to balance. Um, I don't know exactly how to explain it. It's more just intuitive at this point. You can see I'm balancing the light of the sun with the light of the foreground smoke. And then we sort of have a dark band in the center, which is the sky. And there we go. I'm actually accentuating that dark band now by adding some sort of darker clouds, um, adding a little bit more contrast. So that's carried through. And we have that line carried through by the smoke and by the cityscape of Jerusalem. And then that contrasts nicely with the scythe and the tabard of this character. It gives it almost this crucifix or cross pattern in the center where the two lines intersect. Uh, just really quickly doing some remastering using uh, brights and contrast uh, blend modes. And uh, I thought I'd go back in and clean up some stuff. As I often do. It's also a good opportunity to make sure I don't have any lasso marks because, as you know, I do a lot of work with the lasso tool to resize things, and sometimes that can leave hard edges or awkward tangents. So it's a good idea to go back in and just check things, make sure there's nothing really standing out that's going to detract from your image. And uh, doing some more clouds, breaking up some tangents, doing some overlap, occlusion. Fun stuff. I love doing stuff like that. Clouds are pretty fun to paint. And they, they're really not that difficult. It's, if you get you know just some good reference and practice or just start understanding how they're lit, you can, you can knock out your own clouds too. Fixing the anatomy of this bird, getting me some pinions. And... Uh, Oh, there we go, using the uh, shrapnel brush, one of my favorite brushes, and we're done. So I hope you guys enjoyed the tutorial, and for anyone who made it to the live stream, thanks for watching. It's uh, it's great to have the chat going and being able to talk to everyone and interact with all my fans, um, who I would be nothing without. So thanks again for that. Uh, if you are interested in purchasing a print, this will be available soon on my in-print gallery, um, which will there should be a link in the description of this video. Also, uh, if you're interested in a commission of your own if you'd like to have your own painting made with a character of your own design or whatever uh, feel free to send me an email at artist at nicholask.com and we can talk about pricing and figure something out lastly uh, I'm still offering my tutoring service as well as group portfolio critiques and individual portfolio reviews uh, in order to apply all you have to do is go to my website nicholask.com slash clinic and you'll be led to a splash page where you can choose which option you'd like to enroll in so finally, thanks again for stopping by. Uh, sorry it's been a while between tutorials. I've had a lot of, like I said at the beginning, a lot of non-disclosure agreements, so I can't show a lot of my work I've been doing. But thankfully, this one came along, and I can share it with you. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, please do. And uh, I think that's it for now. So I'll talk to you all soon.